Welcome to the Focus and Chill podcast, where we discuss sustainable productivity and habit formation while avoiding the allure of hustle culture. Every episode, we interview guests who have got a solid habit and productivity game. We're your hosts, Joey. Hi. And Jeremy. He's Jeremy. Joey's a published author. A self-published, though. Has a background in psychology. Not registered, though. Has a deep interest in humans. Only some of humans. And a strong interest in habits and connections specifically. Mm, that's true. And Jeremy is a software developer with ADHD. And when he's not trying to come up with ways to stop himself burning rice, he enjoys doing a three-hour morning routine and surprising colleagues by doing sets of push-ups during meetings to keep the energy high. The Focus and Chill podcast is brought to you by Focus Bear, a habit and productivity app that makes healthy habits and deep work the path of least resistance. If you have a tendency to check emails or scroll through Instagram first thing in the morning, but long to develop a meditation and exercise habit first thing, Focus Bear can help you. The app blocks distractions on all your devices and guides you through your habits one at a time. Throughout the day, Focus Bear assists you to stay in deep work by blocking websites and apps that are unrelated to your chosen focus mode. Life's not all about work though. You'll be prompted to take regular breaks to rest your eyes and stretch your muscles. At the end of the day, Focus Bear helps you switch off. Work-related apps get hidden so you can unwind and sleep well. Check out the app by going to focusbear.io. Welcome to episode number five of the Focus and Chill podcast. We're very lucky today to have Monique Linda with us, who's going to be talking about her approach to time management. She's got her own special methodology. Monique is also known as the Time Alchemist. She's a high performance, holistic, and oh, sorry, a holistic high performance and lifestyle design specialist, author, TEDx speaker, coach, consultant, change maker, and location independent entrepreneur. She's the creator of the TIME Time Method and published her book under the same name in the first lockdown of 2020, putting her own signature framework to the test. Over the last 20 years, she's worked with different sized businesses from startups to Fortune 500 companies like Apple and their teams, helping them to optimize their performance, leadership, and work culture. Great to have you on the show, Monique. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Joey. Nice to be here. Monique, so... During um, your focus styles, what projects do, are you concentrating on currently? Um, you know, I'm super excited to get into writing a little bit more again. So I have a project I'm actually not talking about yet. So it's a little bit secret, but it has a lot to do with writing more. Um, and I have been recently kind of rebranding, if you want to see that, as the Time Alchemist, because it's the first time I have ever had a umbrella term or label if you want to see it for everything that I'm doing because it's it's a lot that comes with what I'm doing and so in the in the very early stages of my business I was known as like the German efficiency queen kind of thing <laughs> everyone came to me for like efficiency and productivity and while this is something I still have in my repertoire but it's far out the thing that I'm all about. So it came to me that time alchemy and being the time alchemist is really something that everyone who is my target audience knows in some way and form what that could be looking like for them. And so, yeah, that's that's what I'm all about, really pushing this um, brand forward, really pushing my work in a new level and just learning more and keep mastering and being the student really of my own, I guess, my own form of time management, if you want to, if you want to say it. Yeah. 20 years and then keep going. <laughs> that's a great name. I, I love the concept of alchemy turning something which feels like a limited resource into something magical yeah yeah exactly that's really it like I love how you say that it's also because one of my main concepts is that I'm starting with every single client with every person who comes to me to break things down right in the very essence of everything and that's really what alchemy is about right you break it down into the essence then you re formalize it into a different form of existence basically you break down for example uh like if you go into the very 
essence of alchemy. You take like a metal and break it down into the essence and then you liquidize it. And then you basically burn it and it takes a whole different form. And that that's kind of what I do with people's lives and businesses, really, to be honest. And so I take it apart and I break it down into the essence. And then we take the things that work. We cut everything down that doesn't work and we add very simple things because it's really about simplifying everything. I don't want to make people's lives and businesses complicated, rather more peaceful and joyful and and so simple that you don't have to think about it, right? Sounds like a bit of a painful process, you know, <laughs> cutting people's lives apart and burning them. But at the end, they come out like phoenixes, yeah. stronger and better. That's exactly it. It's like the phoenix rising, really. Yeah, I was having a look on your website and it seems like you have some really impressive results from the time program. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what, what you do as part of that six month coaching program where you take people to the next level? Yeah. Thank you. So the time method really is something that has come alive through over a decade of work in this industry. So I've always been in, in, if you want to say very male dominated industries, I've worked in IT for very long. I've worked in uh, marketing, advertising very long. And by this time, also back in uh, corporate Germany. And uh, that's a whole different level of um, uh, work ethics as well, to be honest. And as a woman, then you, you always told the, yeah, you, you just need thicker skin. You need sharper elbows. You just like need to get your, uh, stuff together. You need to just like get over it. Basically everything is just like get over it. Don't cry, whatever. I didn't even cry, but you know, <laughs> and, um, it's a very, uh, unforgiving place to work as a very young female. Also, by this time, I was wearing a lot of makeup. I had fake nails, like, you know, all of this beauty kind of things that you get told to have to do. And so it was always, uh, for me, a place where I apparently got all of the jobs because of my looks, never because of how smart I was, how intelligent or how um, hardworking I was. That there, It was never even a question. I must have slept with the boss. I must have, uh, you know, uh, induced someone I'm, or seduced someone. I must have surely not gotten this job I was qualified for because... Mind you, I have two university degrees and like I worked since I was 13, but that didn't count at all, right? So I started by that time already. Um, and, and that's like over 13 years ago. Um, when I started this type of work to figure out that a lot of things, not only in corporate Germany, but all over the world while I was traveling and working different countries in agencies, startups, I was in all types of like business models involved there are so many things that aren't working well right and most of the times it was those four things those four base uh foundational pillars that i found were either not going well or they were completely missing and that was time management it was impactful leadership it was mindset mastery and it was energy efficiency and I found that energy efficiency, that's how I coined it, whether like you find energy efficiency usually in like solar power and whatever, but I coined it energy efficiency because we don't look at it for humans. Like we throw our energy away. We use it in the most inefficient ways, really. Like people come to you and talk to you about things that are irrelevant to your day. They get you into meetings, like how many team leaders are sitting through meetings most of their times? Like I have so many people come to me and they're like, you know, these are my tasks for the week. And like 80% are meetings. And I look at them like, how do you get all of the other things done? Well, I have to work on the weekends and over hours and I don't see my family. And I, you know, like I can't bring my kids to bed. Oh, no, really? How surprising. It's obviously not. But <laughs> like... Why are you doing all these meetings? Because they don't have another form of communication with the team. So long story short, I developed this uh, method over, you know, a decade, seeing what's wrong. And actually, it was a really good uh, experience uh, and an experiment 
playground for me because I was able to try other methods and strategies with all of my clients and all of the people I was working with in corporate and agencies and startups. And so I brought in all of these new methods without asking someone. I just did it and it worked much better. Suddenly people had, we got projects through much faster with less budget and people were wondering why that was. And we got more out of suppliers without having to use up all of their time and all of their money and like all of these type of things. So basically those four pillars, again, time management, impactful leadership, mindset mastery and energy efficiency. Those are the foundation. If they're not set for any business and they're not rock solid, you can't elevate, you cannot grow the business. And what entrepreneurs love to say, they're scaling. I haven't seen entrepreneurs, to be honest, that that are scaling because growing a business, building a business and scaling a business are three different things. So we need to have this conversation at some point with entrepreneurs, but Scaling your business is, is, you know, scale your business to $10,000 a month. No, that's not scaling. It has nothing to do with scaling. And so I'm going a little bit off here, but basically the method behind what I'm doing is building rock solid foundations, because if you build a castle on sand, at one point, it's going to fall together, right? It's going to slip through the ground. The tower in Pisa in Italy only stands <laughs> a little bit out of the way because the statics of the building still is being able to hold it up, right? But if the setting statics of a building, the foundation is everything, is basically what I'm saying here. <laughs> Trying to keep it short. Yeah, that that feels very familiar to me that <laughs> I spend a lot of my time in meetings and it does feel like mm -hmm. a, a fair bit of that is wasted. The the experience in corporate Germany sounds quite unpleasant. Do you think it's any better these days? Fewer sharp elbows required, or is it still quite hostile to women? Um, you know what? I think Germany is a very unique place to work. Uh, I don't think, other than maybe Japan, that the work ethics that we have been conditioned to adopt in Germany is likely to be found in any other country. And yes, I understand there's a lot of toxic workspace and in everywhere in the world, because I lived in, in nine different countries. I've visited 45. I worked in those nine countries and I've seen all the things repeating. But there is a pressure on you in Germany that's unlike anywhere I've seen it. And I only ever heard from my Japanese friends a very similar scenario. And it's it's so extreme that you don't even dare to think about how toxic it is. Like you don't dare to even have the thought something could be wrong. Because the moment you do, you're falling out of this cycle and you are going to lose your job. You're going to, you know, because I think once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that's a very dangerous thing and that's why I don't live in Germany anymore and why I left this whole red race there and why I can't go back honestly there wouldn't be a way back for me there and I, it's also I don't serve the German market I don't work with German um, companies to be honest because it's a very different way of how to serve and I'm not ready yet to <laughs> to go there and uh, but one day honestly I have to I have to go and just change how the work culture in Germany is. Um, yeah, but it was a really good training field for me, to be honest. And it prepared me for everything I'm doing now because I'm ready to change how work culture is influencing people and how it's um, damaging us. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear that perspective because I've spent some time in Germany not working there, but just visiting. I learned German in high school and I have... This really nice association in my mind with Germany. And when I think about work culture, I think about extreme punctuality, respect for, for each other and, and not being quite formal, not really getting to know your colleagues, perhaps not ever using do the informal phrase with them. It, is that what, what parts are toxic? Is it because I thought that they were quite abrupt with finishing, say, at 5 p.m. and that mm. there wouldn't be much working after hours. That's not the case? No, not at all. I think there are some jobs where, like, the official ones, like the government jobs or the, uh, um, like, public 
facing jobs where you can find definitely the boundaries that are set, you know, like 5 p.m. you are out, like, uh, but in the places where I have worked a lot, which had a lot to do with like, uh, front facing jobs, marketing, advertising, IT, there is a lot behind closed doors and there's a lot of taboo things. Like, for example, the sexual harassment is real. But don't you ever dare say a thing about it. Don't you ever dare ask about it. Don't you dare to pretend something is not okay. Um, and even now, talking about it, now it's coming up more and more, to be honest. But talking about it, when I left and I talked about my old employers, not naming them, but just what happened and how I felt during this time, even my old colleagues who left before me, they would be like, oh, come on now. It wasn't that bad. I'm like, it's, I'm not saying it was like, I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm saying what happened to me and how I was undermined, being discriminated against me. Like I was, I was basically in front of clients, for example, partially, um, being talked down on being, uh, looked like I was a dump assistant while I was like the project manager there and I was setting up all the budgets and I was running the show there, but the boss was being a little bit too sexist about it and would undermine whatever I said or wouldn't even let me speak. And, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's way more like I was like touched. I was like, tried to like, uh, be pulled into hotels and like whatnot like it was a constant fight but let's not talk about it because it would look really bad on those people <laughs> well yeah mm -hmm. because it is really bad though yeah that's awful i'm sorry to hear that i hope it does get better and maybe the me too movement is that starting to to, to do anything in germany so it seems like it's quite a, a big thing now in Australia that there's more recognition of sexual harassment being a, a major problem. Mm. You know, I mean, with the Me Too movement, I obviously started speaking out too. I wrote articles about it online. I have, <laughs> I have an article about a very um, strong sexual violence experience that didn't have to do with my work, but um, the the problem is it's just. I think because Germany has this reputation of being so uh, upfront with human rights, being, you know, we do apparently all of these things, we are following all of these rules, we're so efficient, made in Germany, the stem means quality, and like, all of these, we have this amazing reputation, so then we have to keep it up in public too, right? We have to keep, it's almost like the saving face mentality in like Southeast Asia, <laughs> it just doesn't work as well if behind the scenes, like our justice um, uh, system, for example, doesn't work well because if the government is more concerned about finding people who don't pay tax and put them in jail versus actually finding rapists or perpetrators that, you know, kill people or rape women and children especially... And then they say, well, we can't really prove it, so um, in doubt for the perpetrators, so sorry about that. Well, what are you going to do? Like, they put people into jail over, like, a very small amount of tax not being paid, but rapists are free to go because you can't really prove that they've done something. So, it, you know, I think every coin has two sides, and it's time that... <laughs> that our reputation, I don't want to make Germany look really bad. Like, I do love what Germany does for the citizens in some ways. Like, our social system works really well. Our gun laws are so important because we don't, we just don't have mass shootings. We are safe, honestly, you know? And uh, we do help refugees, even though it's not the best way to help them. But at least we take some in versus other countries in Europe that are not at all being open to that. So, you know, there's always like give and take, but I feel like it's because we've been so good in hiding all of this and conditioning from very early on, especially girls and women, 
Just say yes and amen. It has to be this way. Just grow thick skin, you know? You just need sharp elbows. Don't say anything. Don't you cry. And like, boys will be boys. Like, all of these things. It's just time that we, that we stop pretending everything is okay. And that Germany is the, the idol of human rights. <laughs> Sorry, Germany. It's, we can do much better. We can certainly do much better. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely sounds like there's a, a lot of room for improvement and thanks for for giving me an understanding of the, the other side of it. Probably be more apparent if I worked there, but yeah, sorry you had those experiences and hope it changes. wanted to ask a, a question now about what you do in the rest of your time when you're not working. You're, you're living in Thailand. What do you get up to while you're, when you're not coaching clients and writing books and working on special stealth writing projects? <laughs> um, you know, it changes sometimes. Uh, right now, so I adopted a dog uh, this year, a street dog. He lived on the roads for like five years. He was taken care of by from an uh, organization, but he didn't have a good life. He was attacked by other dogs all the time. He's like a little, you know. So he's hanging out with me. <laughs> Uh, he's my roommate now and uh, apparently he's very well known in the city so everyone knows my dog <laughs> and so obviously I do a lot with the dog like we go on walks or we hang out in the yard at just at the pool because we apparently both like it he's not swimming though and um, I do that I socialize sometimes um, as an autistic person I don't do this a lot for reasons but I feel like I got better in just going out and be like, hi, uh, I'm autistic. That's really awkward, but let's just get over that part of saying hello and how to do that. And just like, um, do you like, do you like pineapples? I really love them. Did you know there are like 37 types of pineapples? So that's kind of like my way of getting into socializing. So I do this kind of stuff. And, you know, I really like to just honestly to not have to do things. Because if you come from a background like I did, and um, we're probably maybe getting into the story, but I was 19 when I died of a cardiac arrest, and I was clinically dead for 25 seconds. And one of the reasons is my German background of overworking. So one of the ways you can be the best German is to work hard. And I took this very... Um, literally, now I know why, because I'm autistic, but by this time I didn't know. And so one of the ways that I always try to be validated and to just be the best was to perform the best in everything. Like I just wanted genuinely to be the best. And I was honestly, like in everything I did, I was in the top three, mostly the first. And so I started working when I was 13 and I, I worked besides my school and my university. I had three full-time jobs. Um, didn't sleep much, but with the chronic health issues that I was born with, um, that didn't chive very well, not sleeping and only drinking coffee and like eating really unhealthy and then partying and some alcohol in between. So yeah, I died of a cardiac arrest. It took me over 10 years to untangle that whole uh, work coping mechanism, that addiction to work, that whole detanglement and attachment to it, honestly, you know. And I want to say that most of us, even though we don't admit it, most of us use work as a coping mechanism for some form of um, underlying lack of either validation or some form of, you know, not feeling good enough or have to prove something to someone else. And I see this especially in entrepreneurs, obviously. But um, I feel like work has become such a socially accepted addiction and coping mechanism that we don't talk about this enough. And so I took really the time to just untangle that and work through it a lot. And it took over 10 years, but here I am. I only work three days a week. And a lot of people who hear that, they're absolutely shocked. <laughs> but I also want to walk my talk 
And so, yeah, what do I do in the other days? Uh, there's a lot of reading. Uh, I love reading, a lot of writing. Um, and sometimes I just do nothing because I want the space to have a clear mind and just have my mind say everything to me that it needs to say in order for me to just then be, okay, nice, now you said it, we can let it be. Yeah, nice one. Um, also, I was just wondering, Monique, in terms of, I guess, um, how you switch off at night. So you're talking about like doing nothing, I guess. Um, I'm wondering, are there, are there more like, I guess, active practices that you might use to, to wind yourself down after winding yourself up with, with a very uh, active work day? Um, I have good days and bad days because I'm human too, right? So on bad days, I'm just scrolling the internet, I guess, until I realize, oh my gosh, <laughs> I should go to bed. Um, but those are not very often. Um, the good days are I turn off every device uh, two hours before I go to bed. Um, I have basically lights here that are not artificial like that one, but they are yellow type of mosquito lights. They are um, LEDs that are removing blue light as well. So when it's getting dark outside, I turn all artificial lights off and I turn these lights only on. So my body can generally uh, wind down with the day and at uh, the daylight rhythm basically so i'm in my natural circadian rhythm which i wrote about in the book too with the corona energy types and i you know i sit down sometimes i listen to audiobooks because i don't read read books i listen to audiobooks that has to do with how my brain processes information and um then i take notes sometimes i just hang out with my dog uh, sometimes I do, um, some type of intention setting or journaling. Then I would, uh, listen to either meditations or generally do nothing. That's a really good time to just do nothing and let your mind process a lot of things, you know? Because I feel like a lot of people don't have any space. And when, when I say space, I don't mean like necessarily the physical one. I also mean the time space, the energetic space, and, and the brain space to just let your brain process, right? Because how else are we going to actually take in and implement information? But also, how else are we going to get ideas? Like, ideas and inspiration doesn't come from outside influence all the time, although that's what we're being told. But it actually comes from just sitting still and letting things come up. And sometimes we need to work through all the mud like a lotus flower <laughs> and dig ourselves through whatever comes up there until something's blooming and be like, oh my God, you know? But if you don't sit still for like half an hour, I'm not saying sitting still like this, right? I mean, like just be still and not talk to yourself, not have everything, anything talk to you. And um, things come up in your mind, but you need to dig through <laughs> the... BS first because before something good's coming up. I think the idea of doing nothing, this is going to sound so strange, but the idea of doing nothing is fascinating to me because I, I guess like when I'm, when I'm doing nothing, I'm still listening to an audio book or I'm trying to take notes on, on a podcast or something. And I guess sometimes the doing nothing might arise organically i might just be sitting on the couch and be looking out the window and then before i've known before i know it like 15 20 minutes have gone by and sometimes i'll get good ideas and they'll, they'll be they'll be really cool but i guess um i'm interested in this gonna this might sound a little bit um paradoxical but is there is there a certain planning that goes into the doing nothing is there an intentionality or does it just arise organically so i actually practice a specific exercise with my clients that has an intention behind that so you're taking a piece of paper and you set a timer, you can set it for like three minutes or five minutes, and you just brain dump on this piece of paper. You write everything out that's currently on my on your mind. It's a faster way to work through all of the mud, basically. So you write it all out, and sometimes because my clients keep asking me, so what if there's nothing in my mind? And then you write down, there's nothing I can write down. I don't know what to write. And until the timer's up, you can repeat it. You can even repeat, I don't know, why is she doing this stupid exercise with me? Like, just literally what else is coming up. 
and not being afraid of even repeating a word like nothing, 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 nothing until something comes back up, right? Once you have this timer done and you wrote everything out, you then sit preferably outside in nature. Like if you have a garden or something, you can sit there and you just sit outside and you just look around. And the exercise is to not necessarily observe like a meditation or to think about something or to attach, but just look around. And then maybe you look around and you'll be like, seven shades of green. Or maybe 27. Okay. And then just acknowledge it, you know, and just leave it. But the reason why you want to do this is because if you keep sitting there and then look around into nature, that's when inspiration comes the fastest. So in intention is not to, not to look for something, not to wait for something, but just be and practicing to be right there. Because all we need sometimes is allowing ourselves to be present, right? And so the problem with a lot of entrepreneurs and meditation, for example, is they can't follow their breath. Then they think about, oh my God, I have to breathe in. I have to breathe out. Did I breathe in correctly? Is it in the lung or in the diaphragm? Like, what should I do the belly? Oh no. Like, it's all of these things, right? And then they punish themselves that they actually have thoughts because apparently you shouldn't think in meditation. Like, there's so many rules. So just sit and be there. And if there are thoughts coming up, okay, then just, you know. And if you just look at the tree the whole time, and sometimes what you feel like what happens is you you focus and you get like a soft focus. I don't know if you know, like, you know, you don't, you have like blurry vision and you just have this like soft spot. And that's sometimes when your brain goes beyond anything that's there right now. And it comes up with like, Oh, this would be a really cool marketing campaign. I should do that. And you can jump up, get your notebook, write it down, you know, like, or you have your brain dumping paper anyways there. So write it on there. And so, yeah, there is an intention. And sometimes my intention for doing nothing is just to practice doing nothing. So I'm not falling back into overworking. It's almost like you go to the AA meetings to not drink again. And I do nothing in order to not burn out from overworking again. It's a really good explanation of it. I, I, I like this some tactics there in terms of it's almost like nature bathing, mm -hmm. getting up in an environment where there are trees to look at, yeah. so you can investigate the, the shades of green. Yeah. And I, I, I like that you're saying it's okay to have thoughts because I, I sometimes feel like I'm a bad meditator. I often have a notebook left next to me because I, I can't. It, it's very hard for me to just let those thoughts go. I like that I'm allowed to dump those thoughts out afterwards according to your practice. Yep, absolutely. It's great to hear about, you, you talked about your evening routine. How about your morning routine? What do you do before you start work mm. on the days that you're working and on the days that you're not working? Does that differ or is it the same? Uh, it's always the same, just as the days that I'm working or not working is different. Like, for example, I have a wellness day, which is every Wednesday. Wednesday is wellness day. So wellness day is basically taking care of my health. Uh, I go to like osteopathy. I go to like herbal uh, spas. I go to whatever I feel like is uh, my body needs right now. And I do this every week. Every Wednesday is blocked. No one's getting in the way. Um, it's basically like a work day. It just it looks different, right? So in the morning, um, I have a much longer routine. I usually get up bet between like 5.30 and 6.00. Um, I wake up naturally, mostly at five though, <laughs> but, um, because I was in hospital this year and I'm still recovering a little bit from the whole, um, ordeal that happened there, I'm kind of a little bit slow on getting up. So 5.30 usually. And then, uh, I usually, um, make tea or I get lemon water. So it's like a detox kind of thing to detox everything from the rest of the night, brain, body, you know. So lemon water or like a detox tea. And then I sit down and I journal and I set intentions for the day. And after that, I work out between like 15 to 30 minutes. I'm not anymore like a high performing athlete, which I've been. Also one thing I had to detangle <laughs> to not always have to be a high-performing 
Yeah. Also because, again, I was in the hospital, like my lung blew up and then, uh, I, right now I just can't high perform, uh, in sports. So I'm doing workouts every day and they differ. You know, sometimes I do apps, sometimes I do just stretching, sometimes whatever the app is telling me to do or how my body feels, to be honest. And after that, I shower and I get ready. Um, and the whole thing, I know this doesn't sound like a lot, but the whole thing takes like at least uh, three hours because I don't want to rush myself. The worst is if I have to rush to get started on work. And then I prepare my work desk and I set everything up uh, because I need everything clean and just tidy and nothing in the way. And then I get started. That sounds a great way to, to prepare. <laughs> And I like that you're not overdoing it with the exercise, but still making sure that you're doing enough that it probably wakes up your, your brain. Yeah. And good balance there. We've got a couple more questions. We might do sort of rapid fire mode for these. Okay. Joy, did you want to ask about optimizing productivity? And maybe we can keep it to say three tips or three ideas for each of the remaining questions. Yeah. So um, what do you do to optimize productivity okay. during your work hours? I need to know and understand exactly how my brain works and use that to my advantage. So as an autistic person, I work very different than someone with ADHD or a neurotypical person or not. Um, that's the base. I follow my chrono energy types, uh, which you can find in the book or on my website or whatever. Um, basically, that means you need to understand how the 24 hour clock of your body works, meaning when did you, when do you wake up naturally? When do you have to go to bed? When's your energy high during the day? When is your energy low during the day? Use that to your advantage and do like really tough, hard tasks when your energy is high and do the, the mundane tasks when your energy is low. And the third one is, Drink a lot of water, stay hydrated, and be sure with your nutrition that it's good for you. And that is for everyone different, but a lot of people don't like me when I say that you shouldn't be drinking coffee, really. <laughs> like any type of extra substances that are not naturally to our body, you potentially want to cut them out. So alcohol, sugar, <laughs> like processed sugar, right? Not fruit sugar. Fruit sugar is really good for your brain. But anyways, so alcohol, uh, processed sugars, all of these type of things. So just make sure you read about it, get to know about it, try it out for yourself. Like I recently cut out gluten as well because it's just not natural to the body and it really can F you over. Yeah, thanks, Monique. Jeremy's going to ask you about oh, okay. uh, resources. Yeah. Yeah, maybe for that one, a major resource is probably going to be your book. What We can talk about that for a bit and maybe one or two other books or resources that you'd suggest. Okay. So, yes, the book, if I may just hold it up here. So, uh, <laughs> the book, oh, great. The Time Method, it. yeah, you can you can find it on thetimemethod.com or on my website. Um you can order it. It's on Amazon, wherever you find books. And, uh, basically in the book, I go through the whole framework. Uh, and you can, it's really actionable. It's really, at least what people tell me, it's really actionable. It's really simple. And many people have told me it's the very first time they ever understood time management and whatever I'm talking about in a way they can actually make it work for them and implement. And that makes, me really happy because that's something that I tried basically like translating it because it's such a broad topic at times that people just, you know, it can go over your head easily and it just doesn't work for everyone. And I, and I'm very happy I achieved that people just from any backgrounds and with any type of neurodiversities as well can take it and make it work for them. So that's one thing. Um, other resources. Uh, I don't want to necessarily promote a lot of things, but if you don't want to get the book, go to my website. You can go to either one and take the chrono energy test. Um, because you will find out what's your chrono energy type and you'll get 
uh, your personal results sent to you with a report of how you can start implementing this better into your life with an actual table that basically shows you. It's like in the book too. So in the book, you can see these type of tables, but you get them in the, you basically get them also in the, in the results of the test and showing you, I don't know if you can see this properly, but it, yeah, that's great. I like the, the image of the, the phone battery. Yeah. I had an awesome illustrator helping me with the book and, and it basically helps you really to understand more about your energy throughout the day and how to use it for your best outcome. And other than that, I love to recommend the book, um, The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. Um, and one of the most, before you do anything else, you should get the book, The Courage to be Disliked. And I hope I say the name correctly. Ichiri Fukimake and uh, I obviously if you give me a second <laughs> because uh, I have a thing with names and then if they're foreign uh, sometimes I'm not good in remembering them so I excuse me please but basically this book is about how you can uh, understand the different forms of responsibilities so what's your responsibility in your life and in your way of living and and the other way around for other people so basically also emotional responsibilities and uh in everything about interpersonal relationships and and their responsibilities and that book i promise you i reread it like already at least five times I'll do it every year because you can never not read it um, and not learn something from it. So it's called The Courage of Being Disliked. And it's one of the most transformational books, I think. Also here, Ichiro Kishimi, sorry, and Fumitage Koga. Well, it's, I said both first names, so it wasn't that, that far off. <laughs> I would have struggled with that as well, but it sounds like... A great book and i'm gonna definitely go and check out my chrono energy type it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast are there any final words or asks you'd like to share with our yeah. audience i would love everyone to just consider that if you slow down you can speed up slowing down means being more intentional in your life and in your business as well and when you slow down you'll be able to implement much more quality with everything that you do, right? Just think about everything that you do or just start with the small things. What does it do for you? And how does it affect your energy? And the more you can slow down in the middle of the day, like, what do I eat right now? Does it have to be the pasta? Is this going to train my energy and make me tired? Or can I just eat like fruit and vegetables and maybe some, I don't know, salmon that's going to help me like lift my energy? Like, be much more intentional about your life and your business and you'll be surprised how much it's going to help you to speed up everything else. Wonderful. And we'll wrap the show with that. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Focus and Chill podcast. To listen to other episodes, jump onto podcast.focusbear.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a good fit, email us at team at focusbear.io. Otherwise, stay focused, stay chilled, and peace out.